Morning, everybody. Commissioner Justice is our vice chair. He's with us today and uh, representing our board, who is fully informed of what I'm going to be talking about. So I just wanted to uh, make that clear. Um, we've got a lot of business, a lot of great things happening here at Port Canaveral. As, as you've all been aware, you've been following us for a while. One of the big uh, projects that we've outlined going way back to prior to the last um, State of the Port address was a, a new terminal. We're at a point where our six terminals are operating at maximum utilization in, uh, in, in several cases, and the need for a new terminal has become more urgent and necessary now than it, than it was. And our uh, original concept was to uh, move into the Blue Points area, which is on the south side of the port, and uh, eventually that, that property becomes part of our portfolio, and we're going to relocate that and reinvent the marina district. And the more we've gotten into that, we realize that that's probably a five to six year project to do it correctly. And the need now for our cruise partners is immediate. And we have a point now where we're starting to turn business away from Port Canaveral. And when we turn that business away from Port Canaveral, it's not going to Port Everglades or Miami. Um, all of our ports in Florida on the East Coast, the South Ports are full. You can't go to Miami because the ships are too, or to uh, Tampa, the ships are too big. Jacksonville, same issue. So there's only three ports really that can take these ships in Florida. And if we can't take them, they're going to go to another state. So it's really important that we find a way to retain that business and keep that economic impact in Florida. So we've, uh, we've done a lot of internal work and we have elected to pivot to the north side into the basin adjacent to uh, uh, cruise terminal five on the other side is a pier that we built north eight a few years back. It's uh, underutilized and our goal is to turn that into a cruise terminal and have it up and running by the midsummer of 2026. So within two years we'll have a, a terminal operating on the north side. It'll be a state of the art terminal. Uh, we will use all the latest technologies, it will handle the largest ships in the world, and it will be a multi-user facility. In other words, we, Port Canaveral, will run the terminal, terminal and, and uh, the cruise that won't be cruise line specific. So multiple brands, big ship terminal, will give us the flexibility to put the largest ships in there and, and the smaller ones at some of our older facilities that can't handle the largest ships. So that's really the story. Um, We've got some pictures up here just to show you the, the geographical location. This is the uh, location here. It's, it's a greenfield site. The reason we can do this project in two years is because we've got a greenfield site, an already built wharf that's suitable. The water depth there is already at 35 feet, so we already have enough water for the project. And really what we're going to be doing is, is showed on this picture over here. We'll have an extension of the pier which has already been designed. Uh, we did that a few years ago just uh, while we were doing the berth itself. And then in the north part of it, up here, you can see there's a sloped entry into the, into the basin. That sloped entry will be removed and a bulkhead, vertical bulkhead will go all the way across. And by doing that, we not only develop a new terminal that can handle the largest ships in the world, but we also enhance cruise terminal five by adding an extra 150 feet of length to it, which will allow us to put larger vessels in there than we can do today. So there's a double benefit for two terminals uh, by doing this. It also will keep the traffic uh, on the north side of the port and, and not bring it down George King in the, in the marina district, which will require a lot of reconfiguration and road work. And, and there's a lot of lot more work to do on the south side than there is on this side. And when we didn't see the need, the south side made sense to do it and, and, and have it ready in five years, six years. But we're at a point now we need it in two years, maybe sooner. So we're going to do what we have to do to get this up and running as quickly as possible. And uh, I'm open to any questions anybody may have. Captain Murray, does this mean the port's going to renew the lease for the Cape Marina after previously saying they have No, I've been, I've been very clear on that, and I'll be right up front with you that, that we've stated before that that uh, lease expires in 2026, and we're going to put it on a re request for proposal, an RFP, and they're more than welcome to bid on it, but we are continuing our effort to reinvent the marina district, make it better, optimize our properties out there, and uh, this just allows us, to be honest with you, the time to do it properly. Our, our goal is to turn the marina district into a, a unique venue better than what it is today, more efficient than it is today, and still at some point in the future have a cruise terminal where the Blue Point site is. So we are going to probably, 
look at combining the blue points and, and expired Cape lease into a single RFP uh, going forward and uh, a single operator and developer to take that over for us under our guidance, of course. Sure, Dave. Um, we've got a few items we're going to have before our board in two weeks uh, that will allow us to, to pick up. We've done a lot of work over there already uh, in anticipation of, of other projects. We've looked at moving that bulkhead on the north side already to enhance Terminal 5 with an extra 150 feet. We decided for one terminal the cost was prohibitive, but we've already done core sample testing and, and soil testing and all that. So there's a lot of preliminary work that's been done already. So it's a matter of us assimilating all of that to, uh, to move the project forward. But this will be uh, very much expedited because we have the berth, we have the water depth. Uh, the big issues are going to be the terminal, the garage, and the roadway network. On the roadway network, our intention is to have a flyover similar to what we have at Cruise Terminal 6, so it will not impede any of the uh, cargo, space, military, commercial, whatever traffic heading to the air base or Space Force base, everything will flow freely through that area so there won't be any um, stop and go or stop lights or anything as a result of the terminal. So that's, that's the intent. Um, we don't have enough detail that I can give you price and all that, but we will uh, self-fund it ourselves. We're, we're not going into a partnership with a specific cruise line. Our intention, and, and you know that we've been saving to do this project, and uh, it's just going to move it a little faster than, than uh, it would be on the south side. So we're really excited to be able to be in this position. And the terminal cost, Dave, will be less because we have so much already in place with the berth and, and the pre-planning and, and uh, some of the planned, uh, some of the uh, permit approvals already. So. I don't have that yet. I'll, I'll have Mr. Poole get that to you once he takes a hard look at it. Uh, the garage is probably going to be in the neighborhood of 2,500 spaces to start. We want to have it expandable, so we'll start with a single garage. If things change in a few years and we need more, we'll, we'll convert it and expand it. Uh, one of the big shifts in the industry right now is, is the larger ships on the three and four day uh, transits, and, and all of the cruise lines are, are, are developing private island destinations. and short sea three and four day cruise range from southeast Florida. And uh, that, that allows a, a drives a lot more vehicles driving into the port than, than, uh, than a seven day or even a five or six day voyage. So um, we want to have that expansion capability because when you bring a large ship in, just for example, the allure of the seas, when she's been turning here in the winter time, we're parking more than 1,300 cars on a Friday. So it's a, it's a lot of business for us um, that, that once they change from seven to three, four, it explodes just in the number of vehicles. So we're bringing thousands of more people to the north side of the port. What's the latest on talks to replace the drop with You know what, Jim, the, the, James, the, the benefit to this is it just builds the fire, makes it even more important that we get that bridge done in 528. And you know we push through the TPO, and every time I get a chance to say we need 528 widened, we need the bridge replaced, it's got to get an FDOT's budget at some point, and it's not there yet. So we will continue to make noise on that. We can't shut down operations at Port Canaveral because the state can't get the road infrastructure in a, in a timely manner. We're going to continue. But what it does do is it takes the, the vehicular traffic and it moves it on the north side and doesn't bring it in on George King where we've already got two large terminals. And we'd have to do a lot of infrastructure work at the south side because we've got the restaurants, we've got the parks, we've got the marinas, everybody, the, the community lives on the south side. So it will take that congestion away from the community to the north side. So does that help? Yes, barium too. So, so that'll that'll give us some relief for the longer term south side. Kevin, you mentioned that um, because of the growth, that uh, we don't want business to be turned away. We don't want cruise lines to have to go to a different state. Has that happened yet? And now with this announcement, uh, it has happened, and we're looking at ways that we can avoid that. And this is one way to do that. So we've got some long-term projections that uh, under the current six terminal scenario, we can't meet them. So we need this terminal and this is the fastest way to get one up and running and, and to uh, not turn away business from Port Canaveral. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. I've been at the port for, for eight years now and if my memory is correct, we had four hotels in the Cape Canaveral area. Right now, we're, we've got two under construction. That'll total 11. 
just in Cape Canaveral, right near the port. So we bring a lot of people to this community and a lot of money spent in restaurants and hotels and ground transportation. So, you know, bringing a, another terminal online is, is going to be good for our economic uh, vitality in this area. Is there anything that needs to be relocated at the wharf? Because I remember correctly, some space vessel have been. They go there uh, because they have got an idle ship with, with nowhere to go. Uh, it's a very good question. They park up there, you might, if you're up there today, you might see a SpaceX vessel there, or maybe, maybe not, I don't know. We move them around all the time. But what you have to consider is we've got Earth 3 and 4, which are completing right now, and that's more linear feet than we had up here. So um, we've, we've uh, discussed how that would affect operations. I, I had this done intentionally so that most of Blue and SpaceX, all of their operations are on North Cargo Berth 6. And those are their, not their escape routes, but their recovery routes up to uh, the Space Force Base. So they've been using this way. I think most of them are going to go this way in the future. So that keeps the terminal clear of any of their operations. Our cargo operators, it won't impact them. There's lights up there at, at uh, Grouper Road now. It's going to move over to Payne Way, but those lights will remain in place, and the truck traffic will go under the proposed flyover ramp. Um, it, it depends what ships are in there. I mean, if we have a, a seven-day ship, it's, it's one thing, but if you have two, three, and four days and a seven, it increases quite a bit. Gives us a lot of, a lot of options. Also, there's some long-term planning with all of our cruise partners, and this will allow us to make some moves around the port that you won't see initially, but we have, in addition to turning business away, we're ship size limited right now at a couple of terminals and the lines would like to increase the ships, put a different ship in, we can't accommodate it because the berth isn't big enough or the terminal's not big enough. So this is gonna give us that flexibility that not only at that terminal, another terminal is gonna have increased uh, productivity and throughput. So it, it helps us all the way around. I, I could ballpark, you know, just on a, on a cruise terminal that's fully utilized, it, it runs us around $40 million a year in revenue. So that's a lot of people coming in to that terminal and um, we don't want it, we haven't turned anything away yet and we're working with one line to do something that might be a little creative for one season, but we're gonna get through this and our goal is not to turn any business away and to make sure we retain our cruise partnerships here in Port Canaveral. Keep in mind the wharf study it was conducted by Space Florida and it was funded by the, by the state. And we were participants in the study as were the launch service providers, NASA, Space Force, NO2, all of the partners in the federal property and all. And, and the concept was if all of the space launch service providers bring to the table what they say they're bringing to the table, there's not enough space here to, to accommodate it. So what do we do? And that's where the middle basin came out as the ideal location. Uh, you wouldn't need a set of locks. You could go to the north, run the 401 route around. You see how, you know, 20 years from now, it could be this big, expansive uh, area for, for recovery vessels. The question is, you know, it, it, in the short term, I think it puts the focus on the middle basin and the government properties and what can we do there to take up some of the, some of the slack that we don't have that option to do today. Uh, so that's, that's a, a good thing. It, clearly in the study, the West Basin was not um, included in, in you know, the requirements. So uh, the timing of that coming out was actually uh, very good because it clearly said that the East Basin is the one where we need to expand. So did that help? Okay. Stay tuned to our next commission meeting. Okay. Have you uh, assigned a number to this new terminal? I know the other one you were talking about this evening. 
Well, we've played with different numbers. We had CT4 in the south, and to not get anything confusing, we, we haven't put a, a name on this one yet, but we, we will do that in due course. But the, the CT4 uh, projection now is just on hold, like you said, you that, plan to do it? Yes, that, that is still in reserve uh, at a point in the future. Should we need another terminal, that site will be identified today as, as the future site. No, I'd say once we have the new terminal, you'd probably be fine until at least 2030. But depending what happens in the future, you know, we do have some terminals that may be functionally obsolete as the ships get bigger and, and you know, it's, there's a point where there's a lot of the current tonnage out there we can't fit at Cruise Terminal 5 or Cruise Terminal 8. They're just too big. So. Um, Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. It's a big one. Yep. That's the intent. The largest ships in the world. Star of the Seas. There's a lot of ships that size too out in, in the market under construction right now. And, and you know, it's not dissimilar to what we did at Cruise Terminal 3 when we identified that there were big ships coming that were gas powered. We got in front of it and said, how do we, how do we get those ships and, and try to stay ahead of competing ports? And, and that's where we ended up with the Mardi Gras. And we were the, that was the first time that we had a, a flagship of, of Carnival will come here. And it's because we did the homework and we were ready and we brought the ship here and we're going to do the same thing now. So this will give us a lot of other opportunities we haven't even discussed yet. Eventually, Dave, that's, that's what that's all about. Probably after 2030, sometime in that frame, and, and it, it's all dependent on cruise growth. But the, the challenge is the ships are getting bigger, which, you know, at some point, I don't know when the market is saturated, but it's nowhere close right now. And, and uh, you know, we've got some new brands starting. We've got uh, another Disney vessel coming in a few months. We've got the um, Utopia of the Seas in July, July which is going to replace the Allure. That's another big ship. Uh, we've got Celebrity and Princess starting in the fall. So we've got a lot of growth already that we're struggling in some ways to meet all the capacity demands because every cruise line wants unique itineraries and, and uh, you know, it's, it's hard. If everybody wants to sail on Monday and Friday, we don't have any Monday Fridays to give. If somebody wants to bring us a new service on a Saturday, we don't have a Saturday to give. All of our ships, next, next couple of years, every Saturday is going to be a six ship day. So at what point do we make that expansion to, you know, now? And what um, delayed the possibility to get that from up for? I think you originally were planning to open by May 26th or 27th, and now it's going to be... Is, you know, I'm, I'm going to put another plug in here. As, as far as the south side, we want to do that marina district. It's in, and I, I say this, and, and I really mean it. It's like a once-in-a-generation opportunity to reinvent that area. And I'd like to do it deliberately and accurately and correctly and optimize our port property to the best possible. We have a number of leases that expire between now and say 2030, 2032. And you know, some of those tenants will not be renewed if they're not doing business that's needed at Port Canaveral and they could efficiently do it somewhere outside Port Canaveral, they probably won't find our renewal rate attractive and they'll have to relocate. So. Um, that's just the way it is. We, we, have to, we have to look at our most valuable asset, which is our land and our bulkhead. And there's a lot of different um, variables in the south side as we started moving forward with a project that's a lot more complicated. And I personally don't want to rush it and do something wrong that would have long-term effects. So we're going to do a very, very deliberate renewal effort on that, that side of the port. But the long-term goal is still that Blue Points area would be the site of a future terminal. But what it does is it takes the pressure off us having to do it faster and risk making a mistake. We can do this the right way. So. Right now you have uh, 13 to 15 home port ships depending on season, I think, amongst your six. Yes. Right? Yep. This, uh, this scale we, we did 16 this past winter season and I believe we're going to be 19 this next winter season. Well, we could, we could, well, that's, that's uh, um, probably another three or four, but they'll be big ships. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we are very optimistic that some of the, the lines that are coming this year for the first 
uh, season at Port Canaveral, the, the bookings from our understanding have been very strong and there's already anticipated that it's not going to be one season and done, that this will be a longer term uh, relationship here at Port Canaveral. So we're really excited about that. But if we don't have the facilities, it won't be but so long. So you understand that. <laughs> Well, that's the other piece of the commercial fishing. Uh, when I was saying it's a lot more complicated on the south side, we have spent a lot of time uh, with the commercial fishing uh, teams and, and met with the representatives and had meetings with them. And we realized that that's a group that has probably been shoved to the side at Port Canaveral for many years. And you know, it's, we, we see when we're here, all of us, we see the two commercial fish houses, but we don't realize that one of them is very dependent on boats coming out of the marinas to bring in the product. And we've identified that and drilled down into it. And in the future, whatever we do in the marina district, we're gonna carve out in our request for proposal a long-term spot for our commercial fishermen. Uh, we, we truly believe that that's necessary going forward and there's, there's been things that have happened in the past that have restricted them in many cases and, and uh, we, we think of them as the fabric of our port and we want to make sure that we protect that segment of the industry which also protects one of our um, commercial fish houses here on the, on the, the retail side. So. Yes. Yeah. Where the Blue Point area is? Yeah. What date would uh, North Carolina be taken off of the uh, What we're probably looking at is because most of the work is uplands, uh, we don't think we'll take it off. We'll continue to use it. We'll continue to put lay berths over there. We've still got the south side four and three. Three is finished. Four is not going to be finished until the October time frame. So our goal at this point is to continue to use that as a lay berth as long as we can, as long as it's needed. I mean, it's a port, and if we've got an empty asset and we can put something there, we're going to do it. So that's simple. Uh, not much, Dave. The, the, the challenge with that pier on, on the cargo side is it's a long way away from our core businesses. And as we get to the fall, and for those of you that don't know this, the CMEX tower is coming down uh, across the, uh, across the, side of the other side of the port. And we have to wait until four is completed because that site has been used as a staging area for construction materials for North Cargo Berth 4. But we've already got an agreement with CMEX on, on when that will be demolished. And as soon as that area is cleared up, they're going to start the, uh, the demolition process. That'll give us more cargo area uh, right adjacent to the southern area ports here. So a salt ship or everything except an oil tanker could go to berths 3, 4, or 5, or, or 6. So eight was kind of up in the corner anyway, and, and since we built it, it, it hasn't been much of a berth for, you know, a couple of ships here and there, but most of the operators prefer the other docks just because they're closer to where the cargo is going to rest on the, on the pier. So we used it for lumber during the pandemic when we had, were busting at the seams, but uh, other than that, it hasn't been regularly used for anything more than a lay berth. That's it? Good. All right. Thank you very much. Good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any questions? We're good. Thanks. Any questions on the diagrams? This Just, where is exactly that bulk that you talked about? Right up here. Come over here, Malcolm. It's, it's a little better out on this side. All right. You can, see, you can see the angle up here Unless now. And that angle is like at a 40 degree <coughs> angle, 45 degree angle. So it extends out so far that. Your bow of your ship is a lot more underwater than above water, so the bow of the ship gets here. So by making that a vertical structure, we can go all the way up about 150 feet further with the ship. So we get a, a double benefit with two terminals.